We're about to start an epic voyage up the west coast of Africa. Over the next month and a bit, we'll be traveling through 16 different countries. Countries that are very, very difficult to get to. Countries that would take months to get a visa to go into, and yet we will be able to visit them all. It'll be a voyage of discovery, as we'll be seeing cultures that none of us have experienced before, and also we'll be seeing countries that are just beginning to bloom after their own war-ridden histories. This will be a trip that we will never forget and hopefully take back to our homes, remember, and maybe make some change because of it. Well, we're setting off on a remarkable expedition. Over the next month, we will travel through 65 degrees of latitude and over 6,500 nautical miles. It's, it's an amazing distance. And Africa is not without its challenges from a, a navigational standpoint. And it's going to be a, an interesting and absolutely wonderful expedition. Well, this is the beginning of a wonderful expedition and we're beginning in Cape Town. We had a lovely dinner last night, but today is really what's happening. We started up on Table Mountain, uh, took a uh, incline up there, went all around, uh, walked around, saw the beautiful scenery of downtown Cape Town and then out into the water. And by the way, Table Mountain is also one of the great new seven wonders of the world. Now we're at the Botanical Gardens. This is one of the finest botanical gardens in all of Africa. So it's a beautiful, I've been shooting a lot of plants, uh, flowers, bees, birds. So it's a great time out here and it's a perfect day, perfect day to start a wonderful expedition. Well, these are um, eagle owls. Uh, they nest here normally, they nest in June. But uh, now it's just a chance to observe, but you really have to know somebody to point them out because you'll never find them on your own. So it's very exciting to come and see them. Oh, they're hiding, huh?
Today we are here at Coleman Skop and it's really in my favorite town, although there's nobody living in here. But the first diamond was actually found in about 1908. And that's what made this time so spectacular, was the diamonds that was found, so many diamonds was found in this area here at Coleman Skop. Well, actually, by the end of 1908, there was a production of 1.5 million carats. And by the First World War in 1914, over 5 million carats, a thousand kilograms of diamonds had been found, 20% of the world production. The total population in Komaskop at one stage, about 300 German adults, 44 children and 800 mine workers. The mine workers were more from Ovamboland and they had a two-year contract. It is actually hard to believe that this town we are standing in today was once the one, uh, one of the richest and biggest diamond towns in those days. Well, uh, Lutkeritz is a beautiful town. It actually existed before Kormanskop. And I also live there in Lutkeritz today. And it's a beautiful landscape, a lot of history, a lot of old buildings. And I think the biggest things in Lutkeritz today is also still the diamonds, the fisheries and the tourism. Once you are sick, you are not having appetite, you are going to drink this one and it, it boosts up your appetite basically. I just said uh, welcome to Swakopun, Namibia, in Namibia basically. Uh, today we saw the uh, Mondesa, basically this is the township of Swakopun, where we saw the Herero lady. And then also afterwards we visited the Nama lady, where we had, which was the herbalist, where she taught uh, us about the herbal medicine. Well, I, I think it's, there's so much abject poverty and it's very difficult for the government to really uh, to get a handle on it because of the, it's, it's just so extreme. And I mean, the HIV is just rampant here and they have no drugs to treat it, so there's a real problem there also. My name is Lokutolo Humbo Johannes Abarankoi. I'm from Kulumbimbi village. So this is my shop. Myself, I'm artist. So most of the, my stuff I buy at my village, Kulumbimbi. So Kulumbimbi is a far away place. So I like to do my business here.
like the dip on the roller coaster. Oh, yeah. <gasps> oh no! Right now we're standing in the dunes, right along the Namibian coast on what's called Sandwich Harbor. In order to get here, we took uh, an array of vehicles, four-wheel drive vehicles, Land Rovers, and we literally roller coasted our way up and down the dunes to this very spot. So we're basically in the middle of nowhere. The Atlantic Ocean is to my left. The dunes and the deserts of Namibia are to my right. It's perfect weather. It's just a really desolate place but it's, uh, it's filled with life if you look closely enough. You don't like it? Oh, it's cute. Look at this. Oh, oh it's a baby. It's a gecko. Okay, then you look at the camera over there. <laughs> when it's very, very hot, 20 seconds in direct sunlight and it's dead. They say the Namop is the oldest desert in the world. The word Namop means a vast open space. And everywhere in the world where you have a desert, it's because of low rainfall. The average rainfall year, three to 15 millimeters, that's about half an inch. Not per minute, per year. If we talk about four inches of rain year, it means one drop was four inches away from the next drop. <laughs> you get the picture? Yeah. <laughs> Everything needs water. And two thirds of the year in the morning, we have fog. And the fog is the heartbeat of the number. Everything in the number directly or indirectly gets its water from the fog. That's the roller coaster I was talking about. <laughs> wow, that's wonderful. Now, let's first talk about it before we show it to you. They call it a sidewinder snake because they move sideways. Yeah. The reason for that is then he has his whole body length grip on the sand. When they move sideways, no. half of their body is not touching the sand, okay. so they can also move over very hot sand. She does, oh, starting the belly dance. Yeah. the sidewinder. <laughs> Finding it and, and, and then getting it and then see it doing its thing. Fabulous. I, I, I couldn't ask for any more today. Today is a full day. My heart is very content. Well, we're having cocktails in the desert, which is really quite lovely. And it's very, um, it's cooling off, so it's very peaceful and serene. And we're going to see a beautiful sunset. So what more could we want? We're starting the cultural aspect of our trip now. We're in Angola. It's very exciting because you can see there's no tourist infrastructure, so to speak. We're the first ones to have come here since the end of the Civil War. We're seeing a little bit of the modernity here by uh, visiting the Benguela train station, recently built by Chinese um, efforts. And we're going to get on the train now, which I think will be the highlight of our visit to Benguela. We're trying to decide whether we're going that way or this way. And we don't get much of a clue from the train, and certainly not from the conductor. 
Very enjoyable. It's great, it's historic, and it's really fun. Speaking of history, this is one of the sites where the Portuguese established a colony. So they were here in the 17th century up until the modern age. But I think uh, the highlight of our visit to Lobito and Benguela is going to be the train ride. This is awesome. We are at the Congo and uh, we just went through different latitudes. Uh, we've been in the desert, we've been in many different places, but today we're surrounded with green vegetation everywhere. We have the ocean and of course the sun is setting on the west, but uh, there's also these geological features in here that is just really impressive. The color, the texture, the whole area, just going from one place to the other, makes this place very special to me. It's, this is the Congo. This is where you hear so much about we are in Africa at this point and and it's just really outstanding. We're in the Republic of the Congo. It was uh, once upon a time a French colony. It is not to be confused with the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which is a much larger country south of the Congo River. We're in an area called Luango. And Luongo was a uh, pre-colonial kingdom. Uh, they were traders, they traded with the Europeans. They originally traded ivory and copper and animal skins. And, and then they started trading in slaves. And this became for a while an important center of the slave trade. My name is Johnny, I'm Congolese. I live in Panama. Yes, I am your, your friend of, of Congo.
Yeah, it's had a turbulent history since independence, but right now it's it's stable. It's it's not completely democratic, though they do have elections. But uh, they're educating a lot of their young people, and uh, and I think it will be interesting to see how this area develops. We certainly have been impressed today by the young people we've been working with on this trip. They're intelligent, open, uh, and very attractive people, and they're the future of the Congo. And uh, the Congo was separated by different kingdoms, and this area, Pointe Noire and Pointe Noire, was the, the kingdom of Luango, and the king was living over there. And that, that's why they decided to take that house to create a museum. Bienvenue chez moi. We are in Gabon. I am American, but I have lived here for four years now. It is my favorite country in Africa. It is a country that's very rich in biodiversity, rich in natural resources, rich in cultural diversity. Um, and today we're exploring Libreville. Uh, and this morning we stopped at the first, uh, well, we came in via the port and we stopped at the first mission, uh, the first church established in Gabon by American Protestants. It's also where the Western lowland gorilla was first described by science. Um, then we stopped at a Catholic church in Kembo, and today is Easter, so we got to observe a mass, and there were hundreds of people all dressed up in beautiful African fabrics. Visiting uh, this church, we went to Petit Paris, which is the biggest market in town. Sunday is a big market day because women are buying and selling things uh, you know, to cook meals for their family. Sunday is a family day in Gabon. And so we got to meander around the market and uh, we bartered for you know, fabrics and some people brought, bought fruits. Compared to its neighbors, Gabon is a very unique country. Like I said, it's very rich in resources, rich in biodiversity. Um, it's considered a middle-income country. The GDP per capita here is very high. So, you know, we've seen today uh, people who are living quite well. In fact, where we're having lunch today is, is um, you know, um, quite uh, an, ex an expensive spot. Um, and the, there's lots of potential in Gabon. It really is a, a special place. Over 85% of the country is still under forest cover. Um, so it's really a unique spot to visit in Africa.
We've arrived in the small independent country of San Tome and Principe, former Portuguese colonies. It's the smallest Portuguese speaking country in the world and the second smallest country in Africa. We're slap bang on the equator, it's hot. These are volcanic islands off the west coast of Africa and because of the volcanic origins, the soil is very fertile. When the Portuguese came here, they were uninhabited. They brought slaves from the mainland to season them, to get them used to work. And they did that here by getting the plantation system going. In the 16th century, these islands were the world's largest producers of sugar. Coffee followed, cocoa followed. By the 19th century, this is the world's largest cocoa exporter. And these plantations continued right the way through the 20th century. When the Portuguese left in the middle of the 1970s, they abandoned the plantations and there was no capital here to keep them going. After a generation now, uh, they're beginning to get the plantations working again. In the case of this one, uh, Monte Cafe, with the use of Lebanese capital. Um, so we have here uh, a, a coffee plantation. Uh, we will see bananas, we will see cocoa um, beginning to develop this economy again for the newly independent country. He's collecting from all trees, all trees. Yes, they're going to put in the truck, they have an hour, 12 o'clock, the truck will come, we collect all the palm wine and take it downtown to be sold. And now the man is offering you a small wine so that you can see, so you have to taste. Mm. Oh, it's excellent. There's milk for lead. Okay, now it's coming down. It's going down, you see? It's the way they come down. The same way it climbs, it comes down. Today. It's just fresh one. The fishermen just came from the sea and just caught it. Morning. Good morning. How is everyone this morning? Excellent. Oh, wonderful. Good. And we've got a great start. 
Um, the rain will hopefully stay over there. But it's been quite spectacular, I don't know if you've been watching. Thunder, lightning, all sorts of things going on. But we're going this way. Um, ahead of us is the, uh, one of the Tinosus Islands. Tinosus means either stinking or mangy. It's not particularly complimentary if you translate it. Um, and I suspect it got that name because of the abundance of seabirds here. You can smell, yes, that's not me. That's the birds. It's not my boat. The commonest bird here is the sooty tern. S-O-O-T-Y. So essentially blackish. The weather's moving in, so we're going to make our way round to the leeward side of the island. They just want to be able to see where we all are in case visibility gets reduced with the rain. I don't think we're in a position where we can really get back before the rain, but it'll be warm. There's this little box on the bow. If you lift that up, you can put cameras inside that box until we get back. Comment on dit le singe Kima, Kima. Kima. Oui, Kima. Et on va le Kima là-bas. There's a little monkey. En plus, il y a aussi un animal qu'on appelle bon. Kima. My name is Dr. Gregory D.S. Anderson. I am a linguist by profession. I work with vanishing languages around the world, helping to document them. Cameroon is one of the most linguistically diverse places on Earth. It has over 275 indigenous languages and two major world languages, that is English and French, as official languages. Uh, many, many of the languages in Cameroon are threatened with extinction. Uh, unfortunately, the vast majority of Cameroonian languages will unlikely survive through the 21st century. So the race is on now to document these languages and to get as adequate a record as we can to, in order to preserve this knowledge for future generations of humanity. Okay, so part of the story, we on board the ship, we gather school supplies and every time we come to a village or school we try to give out as much as we can to those schools which are obviously in, in quite a bit of need. 
Some of the backstory is that this year, a group of students from Sparks, Nevada, which happened to be Jim Kelly and Jason Kelly's family members, they were so inspired by the pictures they saw from last year's voyage that they decided they were going to gather a bunch of school supplies and send them over to Africa with us. So earlier this fall, they gathered over 100 pounds, which have been now distributed and will be delivered all over Africa, um, but just a, a group of kids who wanted to, to help from across the world. But who wants to mate now with a female? He's got to convince her to come out because he can't mate with her when she's in a shell. Here's a, a, a damsel fish there. It's a, a little guy. Oh, oh, but there's a spiny puffer fish, a balloon fish, and it just comes out because it is in the sand in any place they can hide. They'll go ahead and hide. And if you bug this guy, they take and they blow up and they get all these spines coming out. And then you lacquer them and hang them in a net in your bar, catch your basement and home. Uh, damsel fish just kind of hanging out looking uh, concerned because it doesn't know where to go and it hasn't ever seen people like us before. <laughs> I want to see myself on the TV on National Geography Channel. <laughs> So we're in day two here in Cameroon. We're in Limbe today. And right now we find ourselves at a banana plantation. So we're in a location where we can literally see the process from plants to banana to processing. And above me right now are the lines that they use to transport the bananas in. They're coming down right now and they're gonna go right into the processing plant uh, station where they're cleaning them, they're ridding the bananas of insects, then they're dumping them in water to clean them more. And then they're putting them in uh, boxes and shipping them off either to market or if they don't make the cut, they have a big pile that's in the back and those are being shipped in trucks kind of going off to the, to the locals and to the local market in general rather than going abroad. So it's a pretty cool process. Here come the bananas right now, straight from the trees. And they're gonna be taken into the processing location right now, which is, we just had a tour of. Oscar, uh, the owner of this facility, just gave us a half hour tour through the whole process. So it's been a really interesting, entertaining morning and next we'll we'll head off into the mountains. Yeah, we are in the Toleti um, plantation and seeing the women plucking the tea. Uh, which will be taken down to the uh, factory. And it's a very labor-intensive process, and it seems to be totally delegated to the women. As we live here, we are going to see how the tea is carried from the uh, plantations down to the factory. Uh, it's processed, and I think we'll have the opportunity of test testing the, the finished product.
lovely cup of tea. Quite nice. I like it. And then people that just a biscuit to go with it. <laughs> Much of the livelihoods of West Africa, coastal West Africa in general, are of course wrapped up with fishing and the maritime world. And that's no different here in Benin. And this afternoon we're going to be making a trip to Gombe, which is um, a sort of lagoon actually uh, in coastal Benin, where maritime and fishing activities are the primary livelihood. Well, what perhaps marks it off and makes it such an interesting and striking place to visit is that the communities themselves build their residences uh, in the lagoon itself. Houses and other sorts of dwellings are built on stilts uh, above the water. It's astonishingly beautiful and interesting. Uh, fishing is the major activity in the area. Um, mostly in their case, small time fishing on small boats, pirogue as they're called. But it's uh, an index, I think, of the continuing vitality of these small artisanal fisheries and the ability of these small fisheries to provide much needed protein in these growing urban communities because we're really here in the Benin Togo area which is really a string of quite large cities and of course provisioning them, providing food and providing protein is absolutely important and these beautiful communities that we'll be visiting are, are very photogenic but they play an incredibly important role in the local economy. Today we're in Togo, one of three small countries on the Gulf of Guinea 
the one in the middle between Ghana and Benin. And Togo is a very small but very interesting country with a lot of history. And one of the important connections between Togo and the New World is that this is the place where voodoo started in many ways. And a lot of voodoo in uh, the Caribbean had its origins here in, in Togo. And so this afternoon we're going to visit a fetish market where many of the of the uh, supplies, if you like, that are needed for voodoo ceremonies, uh, parts of various animals, parts of plants, even some magic rocks uh, are available for purchase. Don't ask to. But it's important that this is, to understand, this is not a, just a superstition. This is um, folk medicine, and it's the substitute or the, the original source of medicine for people all around the world who don't have Western medicine. And folk medicine around the world works extremely well, or it wouldn't exist. It's a very important part of the culture, so we'll get to see that. I think it's extremely interesting, actually. I mean, it's a whole world that we don't have much knowledge about. I smoke a do. Today we get to see a lot of the real village life and, and the life of the people of Togo before urbanization, before everyone moved into the cities. This morning we are making our first visit to Ghana. We've left the capital city of Accra and driven out into the Shy Hills Game Reserve. It's a beautiful dry forest, we're taking a walk along a wide trail, looking for birds and other wildlife. Already we've seen some lovely things, a tinker bird, a little troop of baboons, and some hooded vultures circling overhead. While we were watching, the social structure of the baboon troop was really quite evident. There was a single male sitting by himself, and then some groups of smaller males and females who were grooming each other, and some juvenile animals just hanging up in the trees watching the proceedings. Later this morning, we're going to take a ride in our vehicles out into the grasslands of the Shy Hills Reserve, looking for antelope like cob and maybe some other beautiful birds. After that, we'll drive further inland up into the hills and visit a beautiful botanical garden after having lunch. Look at the fire, they got him. Fight, fight, fight. 
You gotta milk you. Oh, Not really? me, down there. Look. Ladies and gentlemen, I was a little late because I was watching National Geographic. <laughs> <laughs> and then of course, traffic took up the rest of the time. Since we discovered oil and uh, started producing oil, traffic is growing by the day. So ladies and gentlemen, no, I'm the one who feels very privileged to be on board this ship to be in your midst today. Uh, from here to the canopy walk is 15 minutes walk. But we are going to do some small climbing, 250 feet, which is above sea level. So this morning we are going to do exercise. And the whole park is 360 kilometers square, which is about 36,000 hectares. And it's a global home for animals. Okay. We call it Tree Viper, Tree Viper. This is the canopy walkway. Seven bridges from here to the end is 350 meters long. Finally, I can breathe. It's much like bungee jumping. You do it because you can say you did it. <laughs> it's great. We're in Ghana at some hotel place, and these are crocodiles. Tim, what are they doing? Nothing. Like, every once in a while they take a step. It's kind of boring. And, whoa! <laughs> Never mind! <laughs> you think you can get this car? Oh, <laughs> We're at the Cape Coast Castle. Ghana had dozens of castles at one time. This one's a little different from some of the other castles we've seen and we will be seeing, in that initially this was built in the 1650s by the Swedes in hopes of trading for gold, not slaves. In fact, in some cases, Europeans actually traded slaves into Ghana that were then put to work in the gold fields in order to get gold back in trade. And of course, uh, by the 17th, 18th century, it was heavily involved in the slave trade as well. Now, Britain, Britain had control of this castle when they ended the international slave trade in 1807. It's a reminder of the bad things from our past, but at the same time, what a beautiful location. Unfortunately, the people that came here for centuries couldn't enjoy it because it was their height of their suffering, but we're here and enjoying it and remembering their suffering at the same time.
Monrovia. Can you believe it? We've just docked in Monrovia, Liberia. Uh, it is a place that is near and dear to my heart. I absolutely love Liberians, but have watched it, this country implode over the years, reach rock bottom, and now it's rising back up. And I was here as a kid growing up and have not been back for many, many years. Among the sights to see that everyone comments on are the Ducor Palace Hotel, this wonderful hotel high on a hill where I remember Grand Parties, which is now a wreck of a shelled dinosaur that is sitting without anyone in it and no comfort zone for life. Um, as a reminder of what this country has been through, which is a sequence of terrible warlords and trafficking in all kinds of the worst human behavior possible. This is the Tukor Hotel Palace, and this is one of the best hotels in Liberia. It got looted to the, due to the war, 1990 war, and this hotel is about 1,000 feet above sea level. It has 300 rooms. It was very beautiful. Anybody that comes to Liberia, they want to lodge in this hotel. And because of there is because there is no finance, we are searching the government looking up for donors to come and rebuild this hotel. It's one of our best and was one of our best hotel in Liberia. And I would like to see the government working. I would like to see the government rebuild this hotel. Well, for visitors from this um, expedition, I think this is a place where you're seeing a country that truly has reached a point where it can only go up, and how much there is a hope for that, and how you have to see the younger folks take over um, and make themselves a part of the solution, and uh, they're geared to do that got a stethoscope. These are future doctors and nurses. Hello. We're really fortunate to have Sierra Leone's Refugee All-Stars on board the National Geographic Explorer tonight because they are a world-renowned band. They spend most of the year touring the United States, Canada, Europe, and here we are right in their hometown for a special show and it's really a unique experience. These guys just roll out of bed, come down to the ship and join us for what will be an incredible party. How many people get to see this band here in their hometown in Freetown? You're in for a very rare special, special treat. Let me make a
Sierra Leone has been a black spot for illegal fishing for many decades. Um, it's a place where uh, being a, a post-conflict country, uh, governance has broken down to a great extent and this has enabled foreign companies uh, to come in to the EZ of Sierra Leone looking for the riches of its, uh, of its waters. There is a variety of illegal fishing going on here in Sierra Leone. Local people uh, out of desperation sometimes have to resort to illegal fishing methods. Uh, we have witnessed artisanal fishermen using illegal nets, uh, particularly monofilament nets tend to be available uh, at the moment uh, and are cheaper uh, than, than the good quality nets. So um, they are used uh, quite widely. Um, but often this is done in response to intrusions by foreign fishing trawlers that operate very near the coast and put pressure on the local fisheries, depleting the waters and forcing the local, the local people to, uh, to resort uh, to the illegal nets. Uh, we got some fish being hacked to pieces for lunch today. <laughs> Going to be cooked by the villagers for us. Looking forward to it. Yes, I would like people to know about my country because we are just coming from the brutal civil war which lasted for about 11 years. But today we say thanks to God, we are now enjoying peace under the leadership of the new president, Dr. Anes Baikuruma. We say thanks to God for that. And this development is taking place gradually in terms of infrastructure, in terms of security, in terms of job opportunities. We have a lot of areas for ecotourism. Like where we are presently, Tribes Wanted is one of the ecotourism areas that we have. We have another one in the south, which is called Tiwai Island. It's very interesting. So I encourage visitors at least to visit Sivalion, not only on sightseeing, but to also come and learn about the culture, history, and tourism of Sivalion. Living cool because I love my country. Here is simple for me. I live here. Yeah, no problem. I love my country. I know yeah, and this is the only place I'm going to stay, live my life without no problem. Today we arrived in one of Africa's smallest countries, the Gambia, which is truly defined by the Gambia River, which runs the entire length of the country. In fact, the country is surrounded on three sides by Senegal, and on the fourth side, of course, the river empties into the Atlantic Ocean. Because of the fact that the country is so small, it's also one of Africa's most densely populated countries. And this was really evident when we visited the incredible Saracunda market this morning, which was just bustling and bursting at the seams with these incredible market women who were dressed to the nines. People take incredible pride in how they look here. That was readily apparent in the market. <laughs> I don't know. 
we're transitioning into part of West Africa that is predominantly Muslim. Here in the Gambia, the people are 90% Muslim, but it is a form of Islam, um, a very moderate form of Islam. None of the women were veiled in the marketplace, for example. And in fact, one of our guides was telling us that it's very common for Muslims in the Gambia to celebrate Christmas with their Christian neighbors and vice versa. As we walked through, you could hear different languages being spoken. The Mandinka are the predominant ethnic group, but there's also the Jola and the Fula and the Wolof. And then you could see, you know, what what you could find here to eat. Where are you from? Me, I'm from Gambia. We moved on in the afternoon and spent time visiting the mangroves. Yeah, but I, I don't need to see any more than on this bottle. <laughs> this, this one is good enough. <laughs> My favorite yeah. bird. It is. Yeah. <laughs> Right here is my favorite bird. <laughs> <laughs> We're in the Abuko Nature Reserve this afternoon and in fact have a number of green vervet monkeys approaching me from behind as we speak. We were told today that one can't talk about the Gambia without talking about Senegal. So we're all looking forward to uh, heading out tonight and moving further up the coast to Dakar, Senegal, where we will be tomorrow. Today we are in Dakar, Senegal, and our first stop this morning is Ile de Gore, famous because of the slave trade. They have a door of no return where the slaves left and spread out across the world, crossing the Atlantic Ocean to not only the United States, but also the Caribbean and South America. It's rich in history, but also there's quite a bit of culture and becomes quite a lively place as the morning continues. Very quiet when we first arrive, but by the time we depart, there'll be vendors running around, children running around, and of course, our own guests exploring every inch of the island.
the mainly the history of Gore is the history of the slavery. Uh, Gore is one of the most important uh, slave transit points in West Africa, particularly because why Gore is the closest to the American coast. So that does not mean to say that all the slaves were taken from Gore Island, but they were taken from all over uh, Africa, west coast of Africa, but particularly Gore was known as like a transit point. Good now, good. Very good. Black beer, very good. <laughs> It's a little different. This is not, we're not back in Kansas. Well, we're somewhere in uh, Western Sahara along the uh, fabulous beach in Desert Scene. And we drove in here in a bunch of 4x4s and it's an amazing place, amazing day. And we're looking forward to uh, lunch in the desert and then uh, looking around a bit and enjoying us. We are at the end now, Tenerife Island, you know, that's the last stop at the end of the long voyage from along the coast of Africa, from Cape Town to Morocco. What an incredible trip was, you know, so many stops and, and you know, so many things to see it. I was incredible excited to do this trip. And I want to say, you know, I've traveled in Africa very extensively, but this is a special, I think, because it just along the coast, different style, lifestyle, it's, it's very important. I think this is the best memory I have after many years of Africa, and I think everybody can remember that. This is the new Africa also, and you know, that will be different in next years too, if we come back and, and see the improvement. I think it's a, it's a good opportunity to reflect on all that I've seen and have seen before, but have not seen. This is just totally new, and it's just a time for me to just kick back and just to figure out what, have, what, have, what is it all about? Where are we going from here? So the trip has just been ever so pleasant. Can't think of enough accolades to give it. So reflection, that's what this is. Yeah.